Hi, everyone. Um, first, I wanted to thank the family. Um, this is a really amazing place. I don't know if you realize how great this is, but um, I've spent a lot of time in like, startup incubators, and I'm from San Francisco, and there's an awful lot out there, and this is really unique um, in sort of the quality uh, and also the modesty, I think, in terms of uh, over in San Francisco, people can get very full of themselves. Um, so I just really like this place, so I'm happy to be here. Um, so I want to talk today about digital clinics. Um, I'm going to approach this by introducing what a digital clinic is, um, what we're doing with Wink Health, which is a digital sleep clinic, um, talk about some of the new opportunities, the kind of emergent things that show up when you fully digitize a clinic, and then talk about some of the real problems that we've had in building it, and finish by asking some questions about how far this can go, like what medicine needs to stay physical and what medicine can be digitized. So a digital clinic is a fairly unique thing. A digital clinic is a clinic where all of the care happens digitally. That means we can take a patient who doesn't even know if they have a condition, and they can move from diagnosis to treatment to follow-up to basically healthy, all in an entirely digital experience. So what has happened recently that allows digital clinics to exist? Smartphones, obviously. Smartphones provide a two-way channel for instant communication between patients and providers. Secondly, they provide uh, a way of collecting data about patients. So every condition requires data um, to understand it. So this is fairly recent. Secondly, every patient has cameras now. So this allows for instant um, video communication. We can look at someone's face. We can, look, we can even, we even look down people's throats with, with the camera. Um, and, and the technology actually to embed video in, in web tools is actually very recent. Um, so that's number two. Uh, and number three is, is the money. Um, there's been two changes, at least in the US system. One is high deductible plans, which are allowing patients to choose their own care. Um, so they're out there as customers choosing what, what to put their money into. And secondly is there are new regulations um, around telemedicine and requiring equivalent reimbursement for uh, a doctor visit that happens digitally versus a doctor visit that happens in person. All right, so now I want to dive a little bit deeper into Wink Health. So Wink Health is a digital sleep clinic. Um, so sleep apnea is the prime condition that sleep clinics diagnose and treat. It's about 90% of a sleep clinic, like a brick and mortar sleep clinic's business. In the US, sleep apnea is a huge problem. One in seven Americans have sleep apnea and don't know they have it. Um, so that's 40 million people. In the world, worldwide, it's, it's huge. It's huge also. It's uh, associated with the obesity ep epidemic. And this is the way that you currently find out if you have sleep apnea. Um, you, this, uh, this is exactly how it works. It's, uh, in, in, in practice, it's even worse. Um, you, you go to a clinic. You spend some time with a glue, electrodes all over your body. Then someone says, sleep. And then, and then there's a, uh, either a camera or a, a one-way mirror where you can, someone watches you um, while you're sleeping. And in some cases, they'll actually wake you up in the middle of the night um, and like, tell you to do something. Um, so it's, it's basically like a horror, like it's a nightmare like in, in reality. Um, so that's the first step. That's welcome to a sleep clinic. And then after that, uh, you, you drive home. Uh, you probably drive back, and you get the results, which have been like, manually interpreted by a person. Um, and then you may have a couple more visits where eventually you'll get on treatment. Um, oftentimes, after you're in treatment, there's a really bad, like people will have issues with the treatment and they'll abandon it. Um, so the, what this ends up with is about 90% of people with sleep apnea in the US never get diagnosed. They, it's, it's too difficult to do. And even if you do get diagnosed, the chances of you ending up successfully on treatment are below 50%. So it's basically a system that doesn't work. So Wink Health, um, this is, I'm going to tell you like, what we do. So the first step, we've built a smartphone-based diagnostic tool. You just place your smartphone next to your bedside, and we have built algorithms that will analyze the audio that you're making. Uh, pretty much everyone who has sleep apnea snores. So uh, this is an example of normal, healthy snoring. By the way, snoring is healthy. It's annoying, but it's healthy. <laughs> um, and so this is like a very regular pattern. Snore, 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 snore. This is an example of apneatic snoring. So you have about 10 to 30 seconds of pauses, and then a couple snores, and then 10 to 30 seconds of pauses. Um, this is what sleep apnea is. It's where your airway closes as you're sleeping. And 
Um, so we've built audio algorithms to basically pull out these features. Um, this is a very obvious example. This is severe sleep apnea. It's pretty easy to find, but sometimes it's less obvious. So we'll look for sounds like chokes. So we've we built the audio uh, signal processing to pull out, like to identify what a choke is, uh, what a gasp is, and these can point us to periods of the recording that are probably apneatic. Um, more interestingly, also the snores themselves tell a story of the geometry of your airway as you're sleeping. So an obstructed snore actually has a different fingerprint than a normal snore, so we can pull out those features too. So we end up with a diagnosis um, uh, of sleep apnea, and all you've had to do is put your smartphone next to your bed. After that, you can talk to some of our doctors um, over video or over text. You can talk about the treatments, um, you can talk about your diagnosis, you can talk about what the next steps are, you can get prescriptions, and then we will send whatever the doctor orders to your house. All the devices we send have data connectivity, so after the first night of usage, we know how it's going. We know if it's effective, we know um, if the doctor needs to make changes, we know if potentially it's not fitting, potentially if there's comfort issues. So after the first night, we can start a daily dialogue with people if something is working or not and have these iterative sessions to improve what is currently abysmal compliance rates with, with sleep apnea therapy. All right, so that's Wink Health. Um, I want to talk now a little bit more generally about what digital clinics unlock. Um, so these are my three neighborhood sleep clinics. Um, it's not uncommon for sleep clinics to, you can notice the star reviews there. People agree that they don't like their sleep clinic. Um, but basically, when you're choosing a local provider, you're rolling dice. You have no idea if the doctor is going to be good or not. So one thing that a digital clinic unlocks is the ability to provide world-class care to a large geographical region. So we can get the best doctors in the world to care for the entire United States. Um, something that being able to care for a large area provides is the ability to be super, super, super specialized. Um, an example of this that I, I like is I, uh, I spent about 10 years trying to find out a skin condition that I had. I had no idea what it was. It ended up being seborrheic dermatitis, um, which about 3% of the population has. And uh, I went to many, many doctors. They tried many, many things on me. Um, and it took me 10 years to actually basically read online for hours about what treatments were. If I had a seborrheic dermatitis clinic, I could have solved that problem in a couple hours. Um, thirdly is, is digital marketing. Um, so we can actually go directly to patients. We can reach out and say, we exist. Um, the average sleep clinic just sits around and waits for referrals from, from primary care doctors, and that changes things a lot. It gives us access to the 20 years of marketing technology that have been built. We can use Facebook ads, we can use Google ads, we can do retargeting, we can do all this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that, that changes things a lot for our business, but also it lets us approach new people who would have otherwise never even heard of, heard of a sleep clinic. Which points to the last piece, which is convenience. And convenience, I think, is often seen as kind of cheap and simple. But I think convenience is absolutely huge. Like, so many innovations in technology are basically due to improved convenience. Um, sleep apnea is this condition where there's 90% of people wandering around basically living really bad lives. They're sleepy. Um, they're injuring themselves in, for the future. And basically, by providing something slightly more convenient, you can put, move people one step forward in the process of getting healthier. Take that one step, which can lead to treatment. All right, so now I want to talk about some of the, kind of the, the learnings we've had. Um, some of these are challenges we've experienced. Um, this is kind of getting into the weeds of building a clinic. I wanted to share some like, actual data and some actual things that we've done, kind of experiments we've run. Um, all right, so number one. We've had, I'd say, challenges with um, recruiting uh, and having respect from doctors, I'd say. Um, I am a technologist. Both of my parents are doctors, so like, I have real relationships with doctors. Um, but I come from a culture where it's like, move, move fast. Actually, previously I was at Facebook where the motto was move fast and break things. And you can see how that may not apply to, to medicine. Um, so, I had to kind of adjust my cultural frame of how I was going to approach this problem. And so I started talking to doctors really early on, and I was getting really like, feedback all over the board. Some were literally saying what we were doing was morally wrong, and some were saying, oh, that sounds actually really good. Um, so I was getting these really crazy feedback, and so just one day I decided I was going to run a survey. I e emailed my 15 favorite sleep doctors and, uh, and basically said, like, do you think we're crazy? Do you think it's a good idea? 
And I think these results actually were pretty good. These, these made me optimistic about what we're doing. A good chunk think we're crazy, but the majority think it's a good idea. And I think that's actually probably a good stat for, for innovating in medicine. Um, but this points to something I think really important, which is what doctors think of you matters a lot. Because doctors are the ones who actually take the risk on. In the US, malpractice is a big deal. And no doctor wants to stand up and look different than everyone. You're basically making yourself a target at that point. So you basically have to understand all of the potential risks and communicate that to any doctor you talk to. So what we've done is working with the doctors that are part of our team is we basically identify every possible risk that could come up emergently from what we're doing. Um, so you, know, you can't, you can't uh, put a stethoscope up to someone's lungs. Um, maybe you can't look up someone's nose. Um, there's, there's, there's about 30 of these like, issues that doctors have identified for us. And so we basically say, this is the issue, and this is what we're going to do about it. This is the issue, and this is what we're going to do about it. And now when we recruit new doctors, we talk to new doctors, we basically say, this is the new stuff. Like, this is what you have to understand. Um, and it's been extremely helpful. OK, so now talking about patience. Um, so before you've shown value to someone, everything needs to be free and really, really easy. Um, this is something I think we learned the hard way. And I think in, in medicine, people aren't used to making their own decisions yet. Um, people are used to having doctors tell them what to do. And so it's difficult for people to make difficult decisions completely on their own. I'm just going to show you some examples of, of like products that we built and tested and the data based on those. And I think that will exemplify this issue. All right. So the first. The first product we ever tested was basically just like get a sleep study online, pay for a sleep study. We had a couple hundred people load up this page, and there was a big green call to action button. And the conversion rate on that was 0%, like literally no one. Um, all right, so we're like, maybe they don't want to pay. Maybe they want to talk to a doctor first. So let's schedule a consultation. And 0%. So no one, no one did it. This is actually what doctors do now. This is their product. Um, so we're like, well, maybe people like free things, so let's make this free. Zero percent. No one wanted to do it. So we were very confused, depressed, had really no idea what was going on, and we thought, well, maybe we should do something even lighter weight. So people like apps, so this is actually how we came upon this diagnostic app that we built, and 25 percent is actually a good conversion rate. That means one in four people who landed on the page ended up doing a sleep study. So we're like, wow, that's a lot different than zero. Something must be going on here. And the big learning was people had not, had, they had no relationship with us. We had not shown any value to them. To them, we were just some random website. And people do not want to take these high commitment steps early on. So we, we, I think this is key for any digital clinic, is to have something, some sort of magic you can provide before the person actually has to make difficult decisions with you. OK, this is kind of like an opposite point, um, which is, Engineers, designers, people who love technology love automating things. And this is an often a fallacy that we make. We try to over-automate. We get kind of geeky about how things can like, be super machinery and it can do work for you and stuff. And um, we luckily have not built this interface. But this is an interface to kind of exemplify. I call this the get surgery button, um, how some interfaces should not be automated. So, one, uh, I'll show you an example that we did. We, um, we, we send sleep studies, uh, the results of sleep studies to people. And we first did this through email. We'd say, here are the results of your study. And there was a button at the bottom of the study that would say, uh, do you want to take the next step, which is talk, talk about treatments. And very few people would do that. About 0 to 5% of people would do that. So then we started, instead of sending an email, we'd just call people. We would uh, say, hey, these are the results of your study. Um, do you want to talk about it? And yes, they did want to talk about it. People really wanted to like, talk about what that meant, um, what the treatments could be, just kind of like feel it through. And these conversations usually take about 15 minutes. Um, we don't do this with a doctor. This is just with like, a, a technologist, so it's fairly affordable. But the conversion rates jumped to like 50 to 75% of people taking the next step. So as opposed to the previous learning, when you first are meeting people, you have to show something. And you have to do it in an automated way. But though, when these difficult medical decisions come up, which are some of the most difficult decisions people have to make, thou shalt not automate is, is the learning. You need to understand where to put these, these pieces of, kind of human touch into the process. 
So I think this is like a really important point um, as designers of medical experiences. Another thing is about pricing transparency. Um, there's just been so much like talk about pricing transparency and like medical innovation. And um, here is a company that sells sleep studies online. And I'll ask you if this looks reputable. This is actually a screenshot of, of them. And my feeling is this is not reputable. And we, we, uh, we tested many approaches where we basically would put like a price tag f forward or we'd say we're cheaper or that kind of stuff. And almost never did that improve things. And whenever we talked to people, they'd all say, oh, this seems kind of like a weight loss thing or some sort of sketchy kind of. Um, they just didn't get a good vibe from it. And so basically, the learning is to be honest about your pricing and have it somewhere, but never lead with it. OK, um, last two points are about regulation. Um, I think uh, healthcare entrepreneurs can be extremely uh, scared when they start. Um, it's kind of the thing where you want to, you're like, you're reading the law and then you want to stop because like, it gets worse and worse and worse. And um, you, know, you don't really know what nuggets of horribleness are going to show up like, as you continue reading. Um, and I think if, if you like, line item out all the things you have to do before you can do anything, it's like a year of work to even, even do anything. And so my perspective, and this is what we've followed, is understand the law and never do anything that actually puts people at risk. Understand the spirit of it and then test early. So for example, our, our smartphone app, we tested that very early. Um, we are now in the process of going through FDA clearance of that. Um, so which gets me to my second point is as you grow, it's important to move from following the spirit to following the letter. I think there was a perspective in Silicon Valley a couple years ago that you, you could kind of get away with not following the law. And uh, an example would be 23andMe got shut down for about two years. Um, so I think the kind of the new breed of healthcare startups is realizing that you know, we have to follow the laws. There's reasons that they've been there. They're kind of smart. Um, you know, they, they slow you down to make you think about things. Um, so as I said, we're, 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 we're doing that now. Um, all right, so I want to I wanna talk about how far this will go. So the question is, how much can be digitized and how much needs to stay physical? So this is kind of like a collection of like six, I think, um, attributes of health conditions that I think make them good for digital clinics. They're not acutely dangerous. We actually first started, um, our first project we worked on was in uh, end-stage renal failure where the treatment is dialysis. Um, it's actually, it's not necessarily a dangerous treatment, but people can faint, then blood can flow out. And so it's, it's not exactly a great thing for, for a digital clinic. Um, secondly, they're often underdiagnosed. This provides a whole new channel of people who aren't in the existing system, so you don't actually have to play with the existing providers as much as you would uh, with something that's currently diagnosed. Um, data about the condition can be collected remotely, specifically not requiring blood access. So something that's visual, something, basically anything you can do with a smartphone or maybe something you clip to a smartphone, uh, I think is a great, a great thing for this. Uh, it can be diagnosed remotely. Um, there's some treatment that can be, so like surgery is an example that can't be done remotely. Um, and I think it's all as useful to have a somewhat younger population. It's not a rule, but the younger, kind of the better. There's more technology adoption um, and more technology understanding. So now, like, given this, what conditions are, do I believe there will be digital clinics for? So first, this is a category that's like not totally a digital clinic. We call it digital management. These are conditions that still require some physical doctor-ness. Um, so chronic pain, uh, there's laws regarding, like you have in-person right prescriptions for, for the medications. Asthma, diabetes, they all require some sort of like physical touch, COPD, uh, end-stage renal failure. So this is like, it's like kind of halfway there. They fit some of the attributes, but not all of the attributes. So this is what I think are the like, most ripe for digital clinics. Um, sleep is a great one. It's an extremely data-oriented field. Um, it's way underemphasized. There's a lot of underdiagnosis. Um, there's a lot going on there. Um, anything involving mental health, I think, is also a really good field. Um, skin, it's visual uh, for the diagnosis, and the treatments tend to be topical, so that can be done digitally. And then there's kind of like a plethora of others, like hearing loss, uh, speech issues, and then primary care kinds of things that I think are really good for digital clinics. So I want to end um, by pulling a quote from a person that I respect, um, Paul Graham. He's the creator of Y Combinator. 
in, in the Bay Area. And he says, one of my tricks for generating startup ideas is to imagine the ways in which we'll seem backward to future generations. So my question would be, do you think this will seem backward? I very much think it will seem backward. And in spending a pretty short amount of time, we found many other issues in sleep medicine that I think are pretty, to use Paul Graham's word, barbaric, uh, and that they will seem crazy that we did them. So being able to build a digital clinic from scratch, basically finding an area of medicine that can be completely rebuilt provides a whole set of opportunities. It lets you reimagine what it can look like. So my question would be, what else? What else in medicine is going to look backwards to future generations? What else needs to be rebuilt? Thank you. Just a question for uh, your app. Did you compare the results with the traditional technique? Because it's great. I think it's uh, wonderful. But uh, the reference is still this old, cool uh, device. So did you uh, compare it to, to the reference? Yes. Uh, in the process of going through uh, the FDA clearance process, we are basically right, we're in the middle of it right now, running a clinical trial to compare our diagnostic tool to, it's called a polysomnogram, which is the gold standard. Um, so the way we're doing that actually is it's kind of convenient, because a lot of sleep clinics already record audio. So they have an audio channel side by side with the polysomnogram. So we can actually do a retrospective study where we take their audio recordings and we run our analysis on it, and then we compare it to the results that they gave. And you've got to get FDA approval uh, for that? FDA clearance. Yeah, it, it's OK? It's done? Or do you go it's, to not have it? it's not done. It's, pr in, it's happening. How long, yeah. how long does it take? Um, I, my estimate is about eight months yeah, from like great. start to beginning. Yeah, start to end. Congrats. Yeah. Hi, thank you. How do you bring uh, top doctors on board? Can you repeat that? Yeah, uh, if you are if you have if you are a top doctor and you have a very good clientele and uh, all your patients, time is very short, yeah. intense, compact, and how do you bring these level uh, to consult and to use your app or to respond to patients? Are you basically saying how we recruit doctors? Like what kind of doctors tend to be interested? Yeah. Um, it's actually, it's been, it's been kind of surprising, I think, the doctors that are interested. Um, so we can provide a couple things to doctors. Um, so we can extend the reach of a doctor dra drastically. A doctor currently has about a 30-mile radius surrounding their clinic. We can pr let them provide care to patients in their state, which in California is 33 million people. Um, so a lot of doctors are just interested in expanding their practice, and they're interested in, I think specifically in sleep medicine, it's actually a field that has been doing financially very badly in the last 10 years. And a lot of doctors are interested in kind of finding something new. To, uh, to kind of latch on to. So that's one group. I'd say is like sleep doctors who want to financially grow their business. Um, the other group is, is like part-time people. So either doctors who are in the process of phasing out their main practice and kind of want to like just do moonlighting, just do part-time, or doctors who maybe just had a child, want to have like a little bit more of a kind of work-life balance, um, and want to only work maybe like two or three hours a day. So, we found I mean, all the doctors we work with are part time. We think that's actually better than, than full time. Um, so that's that's been it. In terms of like one kind of surprising thing about, I first expected that really young doctors would be the ones interested, and it was actually the opposite. Um, and also like doctors from really fancy universities, I thought would be like good too. It was actually the opposite. It's it's um, I think there's a lot of conservatism taught, and and also there's a lot of fear early on in your career. Uh, you just got your license, and there's this looming malpractice fear that you've heard about for the last eight years, but you really haven't had any experience with. So we've actually had a lot more success talking to doctors who feel very comfortable in, their, in, their, um, in themselves. Hi, Eric Honecker. I used to work with G Healthcare for a number of years, so a little familiar. Um, first of all, on the doctors, I'm actually not surprised because a lot of doctors that are in the field would recognize the deficiencies caused by adherence, and so what you're 
you're proposing a solution that's going to improve adherence in the, re the everyday reality, not in theory, not in conferences, but actual everyday adherence. Regarding adherence, in your discussions with the FDA and the regulatory bodies, um, have they set the standard at an equivalence to the gold standard? Or have they said, are you going to be good enough, given yeah. that you're not going to kill people by doing a few yeah. missed diagnostics? Yeah. Are you, do you have to prove pure equivalence? Or is a little below acceptable, given that you're going to be really improving adherence and treatment for a large number of people? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so the way the FDA process works is you find a device, which you call a predicate, and then you say that we are significantly similar to that device. So the way I can answer your question is I can say what devices have already been cleared and what is the data on those devices. You're not happy with that answer. <laughs> the reason is that in this case, you're disrupting treatment process. Uh, yes. OK. So I, yeah, I don't think the FDA cares cases, about that. You're no. not really looking at equivalence, but because you're disrupting treatment, you can be looking at equivalent points. But at least in Europe, the regulatory authorities have been open to innovation ideas where, okay, maybe we don't need strict equivalence, but how can we adapt things? That's, uh, I would love to talk to you about how that works in Europe. I, um, my experiences with the FDA is, they see the diagnostic tool as very separate from the rest of the flow. So you have like standards for diagnostic, and it doesn't really matter um, what you're doing uh, outside of that. Um, but I, I like, I mean, the approach is obviously better, what you're suggesting. Um, so let's talk about how that works. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you.